Hello everyone, my name is Kavita Gupta. Welcome to Nest Summit for Climate 2020. Um, I'm so excited about the Climate Week, everything which we have got together. We are talking about financial sectors, green bonds, how to move billions of dollars into the climate impact funds. We have, to, we have basically talking to or have already talked to people who are doing grassroots level movements. One thing which stuck out was everybody is talking about how to do it for future. They want to create legacy, they want to leave legacy, they want to save the future. But what about the future? Have we actually gone to the youth activists, the people who will live through good, bad, ugly, whatever we're going to leave behind, and that is what the, their legacy is going to be, or their life is going to be. So I'm very, very, very excited to actually have people who have stake in whatever we create and need their seat on the table. Uh, amazing group of people across the world coming together and joining us to talk about youth activism and climate. And to host this panel, I especially have Patricia with us. Um, Patricia Wu is an Emmy award-winning journalist who has interviewed newsmakers including Barack Obama, Singapore Prime Minister, former Ford CEO, Alicia Keys, and the list just keeps on going. She co-anchored CNN Newsroom live from Hong Kong and has been working with CNN in New York, Hong Kong, and I'm sure Patricia has done so much work that we can have her on the panel separately. So I'm so excited, Patricia, thank you for joining us, especially for this panel. I am so excited. All of those interviews that you just mentioned, amazing interviews, but can I just tell you that I have been more excited about this panel because of this amazing young people that we're going to be talking to yeah. today. And don't they make you feel like we oh, didn't do anything in our life? Complete slacker. <laughs> complete slacker. I, I've spent the last two weeks since you invited me on this panel feeling like, what have I done with my life? <laughs> Uh, and this is the intro. This is the first time they're coming together because they are the part of UN Youth Advisory, right? Absolutely, yes. The inaugural Youth Advisory Group advising the UN Secretary General on climate action. I mean, for those of us who will never advise the Secretary General on anything, <laughs> it is just a privilege to have them here. So, well, we both are just 15 year old too, so maybe uh, we will get to do it. You never know, you never right? Know. Maybe, maybe they can teach us a few things. Let's start. It. So who are you introducing now? I'm going to start, and this is the hardest assignment that you've given me, <laughs> is to introduce, I, we could spend an hour introducing each of them. So I'm going to keep it as short as possible. Let's so, keep them humble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to keep you guys humble. But I also just wanted to give them more time to talk. So I'm going to start with Alexandra Villasenor. And she started her climate action at 13 and is the founder of Earth Uprising, which is not an organization, but a battle cry. And we're going to hear more about that later. And then we are going to move on to Vladislav Kaim, who is from Moldova, passionate about clean energy, environmental cooperation, and helped to shape the historic UN Youth Climate Summit. And my final introduction, I'm trying to keep these short as promised so that you guys get more time to talk, is Sophia Kiani, who is the founder of Climate Cardinals. With thousands of volunteers and youth around the world, this organization translates critical climate information into more than 100 languages. Amazing. Wow. And I have three more to add. And I'm feeling like these introductions can just take over the panel. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go very quickly, guys, just for the time. So of course, being biased, amazing superwoman, Archana Sareng from India. I love Archana, what you're wearing, by the way. Um, she's the indigenous. She's from the indigenous Khadia tribe uh, from Orissa uh, with a master's degree in regulatory governance. Uh, next is Paloma, uh, who is from Brasilia. Uh, she's an advisor at Instituto Socio Ambiental. If I did mispronounce it, I apologize now. <laughs> uh, on social environment rights. And last but not the least, I'm very excited. We have Nisreen Al Saim from all the way from Sudan. Uh, she's an environment and climate justice activist, started in 2012 in Khartoum. Super excited to have all of you guys. 
Archana, you are in the middle of big cyclone back in Odisha, right? I mean, the right, like the straight away, we can talk about the climate impact in Odisha with every year cyclones and floods happening. Tell us more about it and how you are working and how did you come about with all the movement around those cyclones and floods? Uh, thank you uh, for this beautiful introduction. And yes, uh, Odisha, the state from where I come, and uh, every year there has been cyclone, and it's uh, we are prone to cyclone both in the summer and also the rainy season as well. So it is uh, the first uh, reflection which I had uh, while starting to act towards climate action is the indigenous community members are the ones who are protecting forests through the community-led forest protection and are also leading a sustainable way of living. But when we have climate crisis, which has a global impact, they are the ones who are most vulnerable and affected. And this is also captured by IPBES report as well. So that is how, you know, I want wanted to voice uh, for them and uh, uh, speak that indigenous communities who have immense contribution, but they are most vulnerable when it comes to the climate crisis. And that is why their security is prior. And that is why their recognition of the land and forest is very important. And their livelihood security, which comes from the recognition of rights, is very important. And talking about the floods and cyclones, uh, which we had this year also amidst COVID-19, which again reflects reflects or makes us reflect that we are dealing through pandemic, but we are also dealing through the climate crisis, which for which we need to really act now. And this should be an integral part in our COVID-19 recovery efforts. Wow. Yeah. That's absolutely true. I think worldwide, not just for India, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. From India, where Archana is, to California, where Alexandria joins us from, we are seeing these devastating mm -hmm. um, effects from the climate crisis. You just came from the wildfires there. Yes. Uh, actually, you know, a little background. Um, I actually got involved in activism because of the California wildfires. So after seeing the destruction in Paradise, California, after the campfire, I realized that I had to do something and I had to take some sort of action because my home in California, it's always wildfires all around us all year round. And so that was the reason that I decided to become an activist in the first place. But it's happening again. California, the entire West Coast actually is on fire. There is a fire that started a couple days ago and it's at 163,000 acres and it's not contained yet. And so I think that that's just a great example that we need to be constantly pushing for climate action, but we also need to focus on mitigation and adaptation because we are already seeing the effects and we have to learn how to stay safe and survive in a climate change world. And so Californians have to start adapting. Wow. And I think it's, sorry, what oh, were you no, saying? No, I said as we all do. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, did you guys see the picture of San Francisco skies With the yesterday? the orange skies. My sister lives mm -hmm. there, and she sent it to me from her window, and I just said, if this does not say SOS, we need to do something, I don't know what does. I know. And it's same happening in Brazil. So if we go to Paloma, like, Paloma, I mean, Amazon is burning, you know, and wildfires and how they are treating indigenous population out there. It is, I mean, you're working with them directly. Please share with us what's happening there. Well, it makes me really sad that here in Brazil, especially, um, also all Latin America, the way that people treat the indigenous people here. Because right now we have like the whole Amazon burning we have the, the state where I live in, which is in the middle of the Brazil burning. We are in cities where you can see all of these images and be with the smoke, with the, with the things in the air because of the, the fires. And we don't even have like someone or some people in a position who can defend our lives. We are in the middle of a pandemic for God's sakes. These air pollutions makes the situation even worse. And when it comes for indigenous people, we had to enter with a judicial measure in our Supreme Court for at least to guarantee their, their security inside their territories. Because they had to promote self-isolation here. 
because there were no politics that could um, sustain their lives or make them feel safe inside their territory. So they had to do that and really forbid every non-indigenous person to enter in there. And right now, as the COVID is entering the territories and they are having to leave some of their houses because of the fire, when they come to the cities for treatment, for health care, they don't have a space for it. Our Supreme Court in Brazil gave 30 days for the national government to give like a response and really deal with the situation for the indigenous people. Till now, none has none response that was enough. And it has passed the 30 days already. So this is very, very disheartening. Yes, and the indigenous population, we keep hearing that over and over again as a common thread that they are suffering an outsized impact from this climate crisis. And I want to go to uh, Vlad now. When it comes to the impact of climate change of peop on people living in Eastern Europe, uh, I can uh, confidently say that uh, Eastern Europeans are, in a sense, the forgotten people of Europe when it comes to estimating the impact on climate change, of climate change over their livelihood, uh, their stories are often sort of put aside because the issues that they are facing daily due to climate change, impacts of climate change may not be as spectacular, you know, as the wildfires you can, uh, like the images of which you can see right now. That doesn't mean that they are not going through a daily grinder of that, particularly if you take a look at the history of like how economy in the eastern europe was developing in the last decades there was a lot of bias towards heavy industry and even though the socialist camp has been dismantled since 19 late 1989 there are still many regions and industries who don't just economically depend a lot on the heavy industries but they are also associating in terms of identity with them and here the importance of just transition kicks in because without that happening it will be no contribution uh, to solving the climate crisis and also alienating uh, huge swaths of population in europe i mean this just seems like you know you hear about it it seems very global but when you start going into the microeconomics of it or like how it is impacting different different individual places i just feel like it's like there is no depth like the, i'm feeling like i'm completely on the surface of understanding where it is and i think i want to connect that like how vlad said that um, eastern european people are somewhere forgotten mm -hmm. uh, and take it to the completely different continent actually i would love to talk to nasreen now and say and ask about especially sudan which has been always in news about so much of fracking and oil and mineral uh, what has you been watching in africa in sudan and how how has that impacted? Well, um, Sudan is not only um, one of the developing country, but it's also at least developed countries. And uh, the effects of climate change not only affecting the life of the people, but it's also affecting the development. Normally, people graduate from being at least developed countries to a middle income country or a low middle income country. But unfortunately, in Sudan, we moved from being low middle income country to low income country. So we are actually moving backward. We are doing the exact opposite of development. This is not only because of uh, the government or the economics of the country, but it's also because um, Sudan is very much vulnerable country to climate change. More than 70% of the population and more than 60% of our um, export is depending on the natural resources. It depends very much on the crops, on the cattle, and etc., etc. So whenever we have climate issues, we have, whenever we have um, like um, uh, irregular rain pattern, uh, whenever we have a uh, high fever, so we, ha we have a very uh, much big uh, heat waves. Last summer, we always reached uh, 50 or uh, 49 Celsius degrees. Um, and um, um, in 2019, we actually reached, reached uh, 53 degrees Celsius. So it's affecting every every side of the life. 
not only that, but we started to be introduced to new um, kind of diseases like lung fever, like uh, uh, like uh, big range of malaria cases. All of that is very much linked to, to climate change. <clears throat> In Sudan these days, we are living a tragedy. We are having a very massive floods. Um, uh, it's, it's only five meters from my house. Uh, the Nile is flooding very much because this year we experienced um, a, a very heavy raining. It's the worst in 100 years. And um, the losses are now estimated with more than half a million. Actually, the last, the last uh, statistic said more than 800,000 people are now homeless. More than 12,000 houses are completely destroyed. And um, even in Khartoum, the capital, it's very much bad because uh, it's destroying the infrastructure. So as I said earlier, we are not only stopped, uh, like we are not only stopping in one place, we are actually moving backward. So we have seen or and heard the eyewitness accounts from all the different regions of the world of this climate crisis. I want to bring it back to the USA and Sophia Kiani and kind of look at solutions. Um, what you are all doing to fight this global issue. Um, and I know for you, Sophia, a lot of your work centers around you know, media, strategy, community, how we can all attack this together. Yeah, so my background in climate activism, my passion really started a trip to Iran, which is my parents' home country, because I'm Iranian American. And so I really resonate with what everyone is saying, because when I when I visited Iran, I realized that, you know, the pollution there was so bad, the air pollution that I couldn't see the stars at night. And there's also a Middle Eastern climate crisis happening where temperatures in the Middle East are rising more than twice the global average. But what I thought was the most striking was that even though this was, you know, disproportionately affecting my relatives, they didn't they didn't even know what climate change was. And I even found a statistic that found that only 5% of Iranian university students can properly explain the greenhouse gas effect. Um, and that's really why I decided to start Climate Cardinals because you know, the climate crisis is disproportionately affecting people of color, and yet so much of the climate movement is pandering to only English-speaking people, which I thought was a really huge problem, because in order to really tackle this crisis, we need to empower and educate a diverse coalition of people to be able to advocate uh, on behalf of their communities and talk to their government about what's happening to them with, like, first-hand accounts. Um, and so that's why we really are translating information into all these languages and trying to get them to people who will really benefit from the education education so that we can really elevate their voices and make sure that they're being heard because obviously we can't do this just alone. There are so many youth from all over the world who are passionate about this issue and so it's just about us giving them the tools and the platforms that they need to get their voices heard and of course that means media and strategy plays a part in that because if we're able to give them platforms you know on TV, uh, in magazines, in articles, then they really are able to talk about firsthand what's happening to their communities and we can get them the resources that they need and hopefully really make the world understand what we need to do in order to combat the climate crisis. Wow. Um, I, I think uh, this has been such a learning experience. I thought we we're going to talk about the climate activism, what's happening in US, too, but all of the countries. But I feel like every continent has different issues. The topic about how just the educational process in a local language can mm -hmm. completely change how people learn versus the forgotten people from different continent altogether to how climate change is coming from profitability of minerals but taking the country <coughs> back. It's been, um, it's been a really amazing experience to learn. I think um, Patricia, I would love to know what each of you are doing or other organizations which you really believe are changing this, the other youth around the world who wants to come and join you. Uh, what can they do? What are your call for actions? Arshana, you want to go first? Yeah. Uh, so I uh, strongly feel we need to redefine uh, the term experts. I think who are these experts? Because I strongly feel uh, now in this current era, people are you know uh, very much looking up to the perspective and uh, the information which is coming from the experts so i feel we need to redefine who are experts and when i redefine it i feel the indigenous communities members have wisdom and knowledge and they are the experts 
when I talk about it because they have the lived experiences and know their ecosystem well and they are managing their ecosystem and that is why I feel they need to be taken seriously and they need to be an integral part of the climate action strategy. And having said that, it is very important to document, preserve and promote the traditional knowledge and practices wherein I feel that specifically the indigenous youth can play an important role to go back uh, to the indigenous leader and have a dialogue with them and how we can emphasize on more and more documentation of our uh, indigenous traditional knowledge and practices. Having said that, I would also like to say that we youth are the experts. We know about our own issues. We know about the issues which is having across our areas very well. So we are the experts. We need not look for anyone to tell us what is happening and look up to other people, but we ourselves need to make ourselves experts and wherein we need to uh, identify the areas, whether it is, you know, various forms of expression, dance, writing, art, literature, any form. And therefore, I feel we ourselves need to be confident and have the willpower and do whatever we can do in terms of our individual capacity. At the same time, make the policy makers accountable. So youths should get a seat and indigenous people should get a seat, right? Absolutely. And with this youth advisory group, the UN is recognizing that the youth need a seat at the table. And since we have Alexandria here with us in the studio, I wanted to get to you. Socially distanced, just so for Socially distant, yes. <laughs> um, but from 13 years old, from the weekly rallies to and now, the weekly strikes to now the virtual rallies. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this journey and, you know, how other youth can join you. Yes, so first of all, I think that there has been so much activism that's happened in this past year that's amazing and I think that we still need to see more young people get involved in activism so much more and so I think that that's why education is very important. And so my organization Earth Uprising focuses a lot on climate education internationally where we educate young people peer-to-peer -peer on the climate crisis and that way more young people feel passionate and able to go and get involved in organizing and get involved in the movement. And so I think that one thing that education is very important is it also leads back to your own personal story. How are you being affected by the climate crisis? As we've heard from all these amazing young people, um, we are all being affected in different ways. And so it's very important for young people to see and reflect on their community and how they're being impacted because that way they feel passionate to do something and it makes them want to get involved in the solutions. Young people are the most efficient when it comes to looking at their communities and finding the actions that need to be taken. And so when we get seats at the table, like uh, what was previously talked about, then that intergenerational conversation is so much more effective when it comes to actually getting solutions to help people's communities. Absolutely. And I know that Vlad has also been passionate about education and yep. talking about the journey from activist all the way to specialist. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, Vlad? Definitely. Uh, in, from my point of view, when it comes to uh, youth involvement, uh, we need to look at it, especially in the framework of uh, climate action. We need to look at, at it as a ladder. And uh, being a passionate activist is the first step on the ladder that should follow further in order for your personal and your community impact to increase. And uh, for that, you need to go through activists, to advocate, to specialists. You need to specialize, you need to learn. And uh, that's how ultimately you can uh, be the most efficient in what you do and uh, what you are actually passionate about. Uh, I would also like to come a little back to the point that was uh, about the seat at the table. Actually, the guarantee of the seat at the table not just being a golden cage would be that competence achieved through constant education of ourselves. Because what sometimes it is seen in uh, the youth circuit when the youth representatives are invited to high level decision for uh, is uh, that under this banner of caring for the future, those who are supposed to represent the future, ergo us, we are just, you know, sort of paraded around without actually being able to be heard in terms of providing our input as professionals. And uh, that's why it is uh, so important to be always ahead of the curve 
education wise invest our time and our resources in our specialization and to prove that we are at the table not just for the sake of our age but because we have something concretely and feasibly to put on that table and that we are not just the future we are already in fact present because we are suffering from the impacts of climate change the same way the generations that are preceding us do and we need them on the table as well absolutely no i agree um we have three minutes left so nasreen and paloma uh, i i think we all agree youth needs to ha be on the table they deserve it they absolutely has the right uh, qualification to say it but from as you mentioned about the communities uh, what would be the call for action for both of you well as for the communities it is the same thing like as all of my colleagues said like the key for participation is education is access to information is transparency is accountability and this for for the indigenous people for the communities for the quilombolas for the traditional people they all need to understand how they are going to be impacted and and what this all these technical informations mean for them to go and give their opinion like we have Brazil signed the convention 169 of the International Labour Organization. That is said that the, it's needed consultation and the consultation should be um, given in ways that people can understand. And for that, my colleagues said perfectly, education, transparency, participation. So this is go for all society. We all have our voices and we all should should be heard so for us to be heard and to effectively participate we have to understand what is being discussed on the table and what this means that's the only way we can have and give a good opinion on that and for that we need to be recognized as people who give opinions independent on who they are who we are indigenous youth traditional and also our opinions should really guide the path in a way that uh, it, it makes a boundary. Because nowadays what happens is that people normally consult uh, indigenous people, youth people, and they just like take this as it was a conversation, but it's not a conversation. This is like how we want things to be done. Completely agree, Panama. Um, Nisreen, is there anything you would like to add here? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that we all have a responsibility to do. And um, uh, as all of my colleagues say, our responsibility at the Youth Advisory Group will be not only um, uh, making sure that we deliver young people's voices, but also we will make sure that everything keep very real. And uh, we will make sure also to give the very much uh, honest advice to the Secretary General, because our f first and last priority is the planet and the environment. And our first uh, concern is our future and the next generation's future. Absolutely. That is a perfect last word for us, because there is no planet B. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, really really appreciate Sophia do you quickly want to say something here sure I mean I would just like to add that I think it's really important for us to realize youth should not be tokenized when we're tokenized and not taken seriously that is when people get discouraged and they stop engaging in climate activism if you want young people to have a seat at the table you need to take them seriously and you need to provide them with feedback on what you are actually doing differently once they give you advice absolutely Patricia Thank you for inviting me. This was wonderful. I've learned so much. Thank you so much, guys. And I'm sure now the UN General uh, Secretary is in very safe hands and very, very smart hands.